I was going to go into a very long and detailed account of, because I'm supposed to be talking about the med media in the Middle East, so I was going to give you a long account of Persian and Arabic language press, but there's so much of it, um, this would be very tedious. So I thought instead better just simply sum it up in short uh, form, because the reality is that for all that there is an awful lot of it, pretty well all of it says much the same sort of thing, particularly when it comes to Israel. And there's not a lot of point in showing the fine distinctions between some of the better press uh, and the very bad press, because pretty well none of this is favorable towards uh, either to Israel or to Jews. I'm going to just go back a bit to about 2006. I wrote an article which I submitted to the Guardian, <laughs> um, to the comment is three pages, when Brian Whitaker was then the editor. And he read it and he got back and he said, and I was, I was talking about anti-Semitism in Arabic uh, and Persian media. Uh, he said, oh no, this is nonsense. It's only one or two small, isolated, extreme uh, elements that do this. And I thought, Cry. I actually then sent him a long list of all of the main press, it was a very long list indeed, and uh, I pointed out that in particular, if you look, you'll see that almost all these newspapers and TV stations that are all government controlled, they belong to the governments of Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Iran and so on, and they therefore voice the opinions of the government, and as you know, there aren't any governments that are particularly happy about Israel or about Jews. And I'll just read a little bit that I wrote in this uh, to sort of sum it up a little. Um, I started it, I said, in front of me is a cartoon of a stereotypical Jew. Black hat, long beard, hooked nose, glaring eyes, grinning, he holds up a goblet filled with skulls and blood labeled the Lebanese people. Forget the politics for a moment. This is the blood libel in modern garb. Is it from a neo-Nazi publication sold under the counter to die-hard anti-Semites? Far from it. This is in al watan which means the, the nation, uh, one of Qatar's five mainstream daily papers. Remember Qatar? We're going to have the uh, Football World Cup there in a few years, the, the country we like to do business with richest country in the world. al Watan is jointly owned by a member of the royal family and the country's foreign minister. But this Jew is only one of thousands who over the years have leered and still leer out of the pages of the mainstream Arab and Iranian press in a chilling reflection of the Im imagery of der Stürmer. When I say the mainstream press, I mean prominent state-controlled dailies and weeklies like Egypt's Al Ahram and Al Jamhuriya, Jordan's Al Dastur, the Palestine Authority's Al Hayat Al Jadida, Syria's Tishreen, Lebanon's Al Mustaqbal, Saudi Arabia's Al Watan, and dozens more. That's two Al Watans. But, uh, even Egypt's state-sponsored science journal Al Ilm, which means the, the science. Uh, has featured articles claiming that Jews are spreading AIDS as part of a conspiracy. In October 2000, Ibrahim Nafi, editor of Al Ahram, the Egyptian equivalent of the Times, was subpoenaed by French legal authorities for the paper's support for the blood libel. There is no subtlety about it. Jews are horned demons, pigs, puppeteers, child killers, lechers, greed-driven financiers, snakes, cannibals, and worst of all, Nazis. And not Israelis, mark you, but Jews, all, of, all Jews. And it isn't just the press. Arab and Iranian television are shows that make your hair stand an end. Egypt's 41-part TV series, 41-part series as long as in Downton Abbey, uh, Horseman Without a Horse, aired in 2002 to audiences on at least 17 channels throughout the Middle East, using the famous Tsarist forgery, the protocols of the elders of Zion, 
it convinced viewers that Jews were plotting to take over the world. And I think even the BBC might have drawn a limit to that one. Syria's 2003 55.1 million ashatet, the, the diaspora, screened 30 episodes of vicious propaganda portraying Jews as depraved killers in pursuit of Christian and Muslim blood. So you really, uh, you can summarize the whole blinking thing. In, it's all saying, it's all deeply, profoundly anti-Semitic. Um, and I think perhaps if anyone wants and can bear to do it, to watch a YouTube video from, uh, there's a, a, a religious, extremist religious TV station in Egypt called Rahma, ironically means the compassion. Um, and if you look on, if you Google it up onto YouTube, um, I think you've Googled the title Rahma, R-A-H-M-A, TV hyphen Amin Al Ansari. Amin Al Ansari is a sheikh, um, an Egyptian sheikh, and in this particular uh, broadcast, it's hard to describe it. It's one of the most horrendous things I've ever seen. He uses clips of Jews in concentration camps, clips from the Holocaust. He sneers, he laughs, he says, look at them being humiliated. Oh, this is wonderful. And he gets everything wrong. There's a scene in which a, a Jewish woman in a camp after liberation is kissing the hand of a Scottish soldier. You know he's Scottish, he's got the beret and whatever. And Al Ansari says, look at her kissing the hand of the SS God because this is humiliation for the Jew. Well, you want, I mean, it is a horrifying thing to watch, genuinely. But it does, you have to accept that even at the worst of Western media, a thing like that could never ever be aired. So you know, what does this do? It creates an overall broad sense, an atmosphere coming out of the Islamic media, if you take it to its widest sense, the Middle East media. And it is this broad sense of if you go to read these newspapers, if you go to take ideas and information from them, uh, then even Western journalists may find themselves infected by this sort of thing. They may not obviously agree with someone like Al Ansari, but they are going to get an overall feeling of wanting somehow to present what the Arabs think, what the Iranians think. Um, and we see this again and again. Incidentally, um, I'm told I've got, what, 20 minutes? Now, if, I, if you wake me up in 20 minutes or whatever it is, yes, I'll be grateful. Um, there is just generally, uh, I was going to say there, I think this is ultimately important, that the Muslim clergy in particular, but an awful lot of other people, um, TV hosts, anyone, almost journalists, uh, a lot of them would really seem to be seriously devoid of much brain, certainly rationality, certainly knowledge. Their information about the world, about history, is staggeringly bad, and it is a sort of fantasy world. This is a world in which, according to one of the great Saudi leaders in the 20th century, the uh, sun goes round the earth, for example, or the earth is flat. Uh, and people saying this in the 20th century, a science journal saying that the Jews are spreading AIDS as a conspiracy, a science journal. Um, people, and of course, I'm writing at the moment, I've just written a piece about the Temple Mount. The lack of any factual information is staggering. There were never any temples in Jerusalem. The al the Qubat al-Sahra, the, the Dome of the Rock, was built by Adam. Even the, even the Muslim sort historians tell you when it was built. We know which caliph it was built under, it's all fact. Well, oh no, uh, there were never any Jews in, the, in, in, in Palestine. There were always Palestinians. Endless, you're all aware of these things, an endless run of these fantasies. But they do create an atmosphere. Now, There is a quality to this I want to say a little bit about. Uh, I think it is quite important because it does push over into how the Western media interpret a lot of this. 
Uh, I, many years ago when I was teaching in a department of religious studies, I did a, uh, a couple of courses on new religious movements, cults, uh, to be use the old-fashioned term. And one of the qualities of cults is that people are brought into a cult very often because they know other people. They meet nice people, they're friendly, they are warmly received. And, and sociologists have studied this, and the process is they don't really know what the beliefs are. Only after they convert are they told what to believe. And once they do believe, they are swept into this uh, acceptance of the most sometimes bizarre ideas. I mean, a rationalist looking at, say, Scientology, we think not for a moment, alien beings, we're all thetans, we're all, and none of it makes any sense, and yet people are brought into this and are acculturated within it. Matty Friedman, and uh, he wrote, um, I can give you the title, two recent articles, one for the Atlantic and one for the New York Jewish online magazine Tablet, which is now in print form, uh, and he said something uh, important on this, that a new reporter, a new journalist, he's sent out to Israel, Israel-Palestine, whatever way. Uh, and he doesn't know any Hebrew, he doesn't know any Arabic, uh, he doesn't know the history, uh, he's just been sh sent in. What does he do? He finds the journalists already there, and he joins this nice social circle. They speak the same language, and they think a certain way. And he starts to think that way. And in the end, this is, is, is a very important book in the 80s called Groupthink. The concept is how individuals who may be wanting to disagree within a particular group, but it's important to them to be in that group, will not disagree. They get swept into thinking like the group. And I think this is important in one way, that sociologists have determined that when people leave a cult, it usually only happens, ideally, when they're away from it for a bit. They have to go abroad for a job, or they have to do whatever it takes them away from it, and then it begins to dawn on them. Now, this doesn't happen easily, and this is we're talking about. How do we counter people like the BBC? And the truth it is, I think, very difficult. You're dealing with people who are sharing this group think, and we have to find ways to talk in those terms. We are not talking about rational people. You expect people like academics or journalists in particular to be people of objectivity, to be people who kn it will give you facts and they will give you neutral facts and they won't mess around, they won't invent things, they won't fantasize, and yet they do. And it's that we're not in a rational debate with them. Using Many of you will have written letters to the BBC or have written to the Guardian or the Independent or New York Times or whatever. And you know the sort of, either they just don't publish your letter if it's a newspaper or the BBC sends something back saying you're talking through your hat. It's not a rational thing, no matter how many facts you put in front of people. Um, oh, we've seen some examples of that already and I'll give you some more of that too. Um, The, the, there is one, so far, only one really good, full study of this. And this is Stephanie Gutman's book. It's 10 years out of date, but I do still recommend it. It's called The Other War. You can still get second-hand copies on Amazon. I've got a copy sitting down there. Uh, and it is still very effective, because if you read Stephanie Gutman writing 10 years ago, and then you read someone like Matty Freeman writing today, you will see that very little has changed. I also wanted to tell you, if, uh, the trouble is it's such a big hall that you won't be able to see this, except unless you're in the front row. But I'll tell you what it is, and you can look it up, look, go to Amazon, find the book, and look at the fo cover photograph. It's a photograph of about, who knows, 50 journalists, whatever, maybe more, and they're all circling uh, a presumably Palestinian boy who's throwing a rock at a wall, no Israeli troops, nothing in sight. The journalists all know they're photographing a lie. They can't miss it. 
If you're in that group, you, can, you know perfectly well. Here's you with your camera, and here are all your friends with cameras, and the boys. There's an Italian journalist, a uh, photojournalist, who wrote an extremely interesting study of this same problem. <laughs> um, his name is, if you look him up, his name is Ruben Salvadori. And he did an, an interview, and he made a video particularly, and you need to go to Honest Reporting to an article called Exposed Photographer Reveals Market, Not Truth, Behind Conflict Images. And he gave examples of where he was in the West Bank, and he, uh, well, say he was doing it as, a, as his own project, but uh, the journalists, uh, the photojournalists, were setting things up. They were saying, either often paying or encouraging a Palestinian boy to, they would set fire to towers, they would create an atmosphere uh, of uh, violence going on when there wasn't any. Uh, and they would send those photographs, those photographs would appear in the New York Times or the Guardian, wherever. Uh, here's going, I'll give you one example, particularly a take from Stephanie Gruppmann's book. She says that, I've um, got the wrong glasses on to read this, uh, Noam Katz, um, of MFA, uh, of the, uh, the um, foreign ministry in Israel, um, Ministry for Foreign Affairs. He took it, an Australian TV reporter to a West Bank checkpoint. It was a slow day, nothing was happening. The newsman finds parked nearby an Israeli tank. So he sets up the camera and he starts to give a news report and he says, it's the worst day of fighting so far. Now, his colleague who's with him, so, so he says, I'm just quoting that, mate, there's nothing going on here. <laughs> and the, uh, the reporter says, I didn't come all this way to say that. That's what you're dealing with. He's going to tell a lie. He knows he's going to tell a lie. But he also knows, or doesn't maybe suspect, the impact that's going to have on a lot of people, including Jews. Um, here's another example. Um, Deborah Cogan, who was a photojournalist herself, she says, after eating, we'd drive around the West Bank and wait for the Palestinian kids to throw rocks at Israeli soldiers which we knew they would do only once a critical mass of journalists had assembled. What's that mean? That means the journalists are provoking the rock throwing and whatever else they may like to see. The journalists themselves are implicit or complicit in this um, activity which could prove to be very violent. Um, one of the most, again, outstanding examples of how bad things can be. Some of you may remember this. Uh, there was a young man, Jewish boy, called Tuvia Grossman, 20, 20 something years old. And a photograph appeared on the New York Times. And it, 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 it showed a young, what it said was a young Palestinian, and there was, a, there was a policeman standing over him with a baton. The Palestinian boy is being beaten by the Israeli policeman. Well, first of all, Trivia Grossman's father saw this. He said, that's my son. He's a Jew. He's not a Palestinian. This isn't on the, and they said it was on the Temple Mount. He said, there's a petrol station behind him. There aren't any petrol stations on the Temple Mount. And the story came out because Trivia Grossman himself, who had had to go to hospital, he had been seriously attacked by a group of Palestinian youth, had to go to hospital for it. The policeman was an Israeli policeman chasing the Palestinians off. That is how thoroughly distorted it can become. And some people will read about that and then say, okay, that's the truth. But um, I think we're almost, do I have just a minute or two more just to see if I to bring it to a, a side? Um, It's already been mentioned here, and I'll just bring, go back to that, that um, Riccardo Trist Cristiano, an Italian producer in the Jerusalem Bureau of Italian TV station RAI, he said, we always respect the journalistic rules of the PA for work in Palestine. 
because they know the Palestinian Authority or Hamas censor, threaten, and make it quite clear that if you have already um, written something that was not complimentary to them, something that was critical, you won't get invited back again. You won't be allowed in again. You lose your job. So they go along with it. On the other hand, in Israel, there isn't that level of censorship. Only the most security crucial things are censored, as they would be in this country or anywhere else. And as a result, they know they can say anything they like about Israel, and they won't be damaged in any way. Just finally, I will say that one of the things that comes up, if you read um, Manfred Gershenfeld's new, new book, uh, uh, The War of a Million Cuts, um, and also something in, in Stephanie Goodman's book is, and we may talk about this much more, is the lack of real coherence within Israel itself. The government does not have a really serious and well-concentrated media presence, PR presence. The Palestinians do. The Palestinians know exactly what they're doing, whether it be creating false pictures through Hollywood, whether it be working with the media to create uh, things like Janine and so on. Um, they know what they're up to. Hamas know what they're doing. The Israelis, in a sense, ought to know even better, but they are still not achieving this concentration of because they're almost reluctant to be too critical of the media. Uh, and I think that when we not have honest reporting, camera, all sorts of BBC Watch, obviously, and, and others, uh, we've got sort of beginnings of something moving, but we, what we need is a centralization, perhaps, of that, and a lot more money poured into it, and some real PR experts working to change the whole narrative. <laughs>